the clock on the dot. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the NSAFE Client Education Series webinars. My name is Rich Heinzenberger. I'm a project manager here at NSAFE and today's presentation is on risk-based emergency management programs and it's being presented by Jaron Waller. Jaron is a CSP and a project manager out of our Jackson, Mississippi office. But uh, once again, thank you for joining us and uh, we'll get started here. I'll turn it over to Jaron. Hey, how's it going everyone? Um, my name is Jaron Waller and I'm a certified safety professional with NSAFE uh, based out of their Jackson, Mississippi office. Um, glad everyone could, can join us today. I think we're gonna have Hopefully I have a really exciting discussion. Um, hopefully I can introduce some concepts and tools uh, for you guys to be able to use moving forward uh, in regards to you know, building up resi resiliency uh, with, within your, your business. Um, at the end of the day, my technical background is in Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Um, as far as my professional experience, I'm in SAFE's technical lead uh, when it comes to emergency services that we provide our clients. Uh, I've got 10 plus years of industry experience in oil and gas uh, and uh, critical manufacturing. Uh, my first job out of school was was an emergency response coordinator for an oil and gas facility uh, where I learned uh, industrial firefighting, uh, has, hazmat emergency response, uh, confined space rescue and marine oil spill response. Um, so before we get things kicked off, um, you know, Rich and I wanted to kind of just pull the audience and just kind of get a little familiar with where you feel like you stand in regards to your knowledge of risk. Uh, so Rich is going to put a polling question up here in just a second um, that we'll talk about. There we go. Looks like the responses are trickling in. Potential danger, that's a good one. Emergent situation, oh, these are all good submissions. Employee injuries. Risky, yes. <laughs> okay, we'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll we'll kind of move on to the presentation. Okay. Good ones in there. Yeah, there really are some good ones. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, these are all uh, great examples of you know variables that we consider uh, in the risk assessment process. Um, you know, some of them are actual um, you know factors that we consider in developing severity or probability. Um, you know, spills, th uh, things of that nature, kind of examples of some of the threats and hazards that we're exposed to. Uh, which kind of define what the overall risk is. So these are all uh, good examples and, and you know, provides uh, a good foundation for exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so with that being said, we'll kind of go ahead and get things kicked off with the, uh, you know, with some of these specific uh, discussion topics that I want to present. Uh, so for today's discussion, I really want the group to focus on three key takeaways. Uh, and out of these three, the first that we're going to talk about are some consensus standards and partnership programs that are available uh, to the private sector, uh, specifically focusing on emergency management and business continuity. Uh, the second key takeaway is we're going to kind of go in depth um, in regards to how do you perform a focused risk assessment, specifically looking at uh, threats and hazards that would impact your business operation. And that's that's what the business impact analysis is, which to me is one of the most crucial points uh, in order to mitigate risk is having that impact analysis in place. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to talk about just some pillars for success uh, for the successful implementation of an emergency management and business continuity program. 
you know, what are the metrics and KPIs that we look for as practitioners to show that we're actually making progress? Uh, how do we use the how do we use these key points um, and these data sets to make decision informed decisions, um, you know, at the senior management level? So first, uh, I just want to talk about some current challenges that I feel like, you know, I've faced throughout my career and I've kind of been able to summarize them into a few categories uh, that I think will make sense. Uh, so the, the first challenge that I kind of want to introduce to you um, is the concept of compliance versus risk based programs. Uh, so at the end of the day, we're all pretty familiar with the terms emergency management and business continuity. Uh, they are very similar in nature, but they do have some distinct differences. Um, in my mind, you know, emergency management is the ongoing process uh, that businesses use to prepare for, respond to, and recover from the emergencies that threaten life, property, or the environment. Whereas on the opposite side of that, business continuity uh, is kind of focusing more on the identification of operational risk and what are you needing to do to maintain critical infrastructure and continuity of services once those threats do occur. OK. Um, and when disaster strikes, understanding that, you know, effective communication and transparency is imperative for building confidence and trust with your employees, customers, suppliers and investors. And by, when companies are able to communicate that a plan is in place, their businesses are able to demonstrate their commitment to providing a, a safe and resilient workforce, which ultimately lead, leads to reliable services and customer loyalty, okay? Which is exactly what these programs are designed to do, okay? So in order to meet this objective, it's critical that your business has a strategic plan in place that defines these activities, okay? So, with you know over the last 12 years um, i thought getting into this profession that i was going to see a, a drastic decline in the amount of workplace emergencies and disasters that occur in our area um, unfortunately if, as you look at the data here over the last 20 years the number of disasters really aren't going down uh, we're, we're still just as equally is susceptible to these types of to the various types of threats uh, that our businesses face you know, prior to the, to the establishment of an emergency management um, uh, to the Department of, uh, of Emergency Management. Uh, when you start to look at some of the cost categories, it's pretty clear uh, which ones impact our nation the most. Uh, so we're very vulnerable to fires and severe weather. Uh, we also have a lot of tropical storms that are kind of geographically located uh, along the, the southeast. Uh, we have floods, chemical releases. Uh, there's lots of different threats that that we face on a day to day basis. OK. Uh, so with that being said, why do we feel like those numbers are not going down? Um, we've got these, you know, we all have some type of written emergency response plan in place, we all probably assume that it's that it's going to be effective when we need it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make um, in this presentation or this discussion with you guys is that there, there are some key issues that we can categorize that m most all businesses are have somewhat uh, are somewhat susceptible to. Uh, really, at the end of the day, the, the first one is the regulatory impl imp excuse me, regulatory implications. Um, many businesses um, are required to have the various types of regulatory plans in place, whether it's through the Department of Homeland Security, whether it's DOT, EPA, OSHA, TSA, or the US Coast Guard. Each one of these regulatory bodies has its own version of saying that if it's applicable to your your business operation, you must have a plan in place that addresses X, Y, Z. And the issue with that is that many companies uh, start to copy and paste their programs just to focus on focusing on compliance 
uh, to meet the regulatory objectives that are defined within the regulation. And the issue with that is that most of these plans lack integration. They don't have a management system. Uh, they're managed in silos. Uh, they're not updated regularly and they're not integrated into the business operation. Okay, so that's one of the first key issues that I see across many of the organizations that we help consult on. Uh, the second issue is leadership philosophy. So a lot of the times I feel like when you're when disaster strikes, a lot of the decisions are made not based on risk, but it's it's based on intuitive thinking. OK, and what I mean by intuitive thinking, there was a TED talk a couple of years ago that focused on human bias and it's why people underprepare for disasters. And what Dr. Howard is saying here is that we make many of our decisions extremely well with intuitive thinking, but intuitive thinking presents challenges for low probability, high consequence events, which are known as black swan events. Um, and our brains are simply not designed to think effectively uh, in these circumstances, okay? So if your leadership team doesn't regularly practice uh, tabletop drills, and if they're not exposed to these real quick decision making uh, instances, um, it's going to be a challenge moving forward as far as how you're going to effectively manage these programs. OK, another key issue here is that when it comes to investing into the resources needed to have an effective program, there's typically a limited return on investment. OK. One of the first projects I ever tried to implement was a mass notification system uh, for one of my uh, one of my companies and the plant manager said initially, you know, why would I need to spend this money when we've never needed it before? And that's kind of the outlook that many plant managers and senior management teams have is we, you know, we've, we've never needed this until now. Why are we needing to invest in it all of a sudden? OK, and there's that's just a hard concept to sell because there is very limited return on investment when you're looking at low probability, high consequence scenarios. OK. Uh, the third issue is kind of focuses on new and emerging risk. Um, so we, we are informed of these you know, new risks uh, every day that come across our desk, whether it's you know various cyber attacks that are occurring, if it's a um, you know, maybe it's a it's a health related issue that's coming across uh, the uh, the organization, whatever it is. I kind of call it the topic of the month. It, it's getting the most attention because it's new. Maybe we're a little more vulnerable to it. Uh, we get really excited about it. We have different people lobbying for it. And really, at the end of the day, it becomes who can scream the loudest. OK, so we start to focus on those activities versus truly fit focusing on what the, the physical risks are. Uh, to our plant. Um, and lastly, it's the concept of the all hazards approach. So we've probably all heard this approach before. Uh, and I'm not saying that we need to stop taking on an all hazards approach, but the issue is that the all hazards approach is really, in my mind, uh, it's there to guide you in the hazard identification process, but it's not really intended that every single threat uh, has the same amount of resources allocated to it evenly. OK, and what I mean by that is, as you see, this bullet point here is the allocation of resources are evenly distributed. So if, if I have 10 different threats that my organization faces, I'm going to take my budget and divide that by 10. OK, so that every single threat gets the same amount of financial investment. And that's kind of an issue uh, moving forward to have an effective program which is why we're wanting to have this discussion about what is what does it mean to have a risk based program versus an all hazards approach. So next we're going to just kind of quickly talk about some of the consensus standards and partnership programs that uh, that are available to you guys. Um, so first uh, let's talk about what prep is. So prep uh, PS prep is a program um, and a co collaborative partnership and certification process between the Department of Homeland Security and the private sector with the intent of promoting preparedness in order to, to enhance uh, organizational resiliency. OK, uh, and when DHS was initially established, 
the organization identified 18 critical infrastructure sectors that were imperative to our daily lives. Uh, some of these sectors include banking and finance, critical manufacturing, energy, public and private health care, public utilities, and transportation systems. Okay. So these are great programs and certification processes that we're uh, able to achieve to ensure we have a, a truly effective uh, emergency management and business continuity program. So with that being said, NFPA 1600 is the blueprint for the PS prep certification criteria. Uh, the standard provides guidelines for the development, implementation, and maintenance of a fully integrated emergency management and business continuity program and it's completely adaptable and can be used uh, and it can be customized according to your specific risk uh, ultimately it's a robust framework to ensure um, that's vital to ensure your company is prepared for future disruptions and that you're able to remain operational in times of crisis okay the standard at the end of the day is kind of broken down in i would say five key elements Okay, it's program administration. I think most companies do the, the first element pretty well. They all have written programs that define management commitment. Uh, they all allocate resources to those programs. Uh, they do a pretty good job of maintaining compliance with the regulations that they're required to comply with. However, when it comes to planning, there's definitely opportunity uh, to improve, okay? Most of the risk assessments that I've seen uh, were maybe not as adequate as they needed to be. Uh, maybe the, the the data that they were using was not valid. Uh, the people that were performing the risk assessments maybe didn't have the experience they needed uh, to be performing those types of risk assessments. OK, uh, also an, another weakness that I see throughout industry is the implementation, uh, the practical, the implementation and practical application of these programs okay so there's various things that we talk about uh, when it comes to implementation but the main thing is can you carry out an effective emergency response how does your organization respond to and communicate in the event of a crisis how well are you uh, how organized are you in your recovery efforts uh, those are the issues that i tend to see uh, that are uh, most frequently uh, seen in those types of instances. Uh, training and education, most companies do a pretty good job there. Uh, they, they do a pretty good job of separating who's essential and who's not essential and training them accordingly. Uh, the last key element is, in my mind, another weakness. So it's the kind of the program maintenance and continuous improvement opportunities. Uh, most companies that I've seen uh, don't really have metrics specifically focusing on how effective your emergency management and business continuity programs are. They look at health and safety, they look at environmental, we look at finance, we look at production, but when it comes to emergency management uh, and business continuity, it's not typically a KPI that the senior management team is looking at. And I think that's uh, a key issue with many of our programs, okay? So now let's kind of start going in depth. Uh, into the risk assessment and business impact analysis. OK, so this is a process that I find to be very important. So the first step is to basically identify your hazards. OK, so in order to assess your risk, you have to identify the threats and those threats are broken down into three categories. They're natural, uh, natural hazards. Are they man made? Are they technological? OK, and I'm getting examples of all of each of those in those categories. OK, the important part here is that you don't guess. Use proven resources. OK, uh, reach out to local or state you know, emergency management officials. Talk with your property insurers, your underwriters. Speak with a risk engineer. Uh, go online. I'm going to show you some examples of some of the resources that you can find on FEMA's websites. Talk to industry experts. The, these types of uh, practitioners are going to provide you with valid data, and that's what you need in order to make a good risk assessment uh, before you even get to the, uh, the the quantitative component of it. You've got to have good data first. OK. Um, 
So with that being said, let's let's maybe take a look at some of the examples that you can find online. So this is a national risk index uh, that you can find in the FEMA's website. Uh, so it kind of goes through and you can look at uh, the various types of threats that would affect your operation. It tells you what the expected annual loss would be, what the social vulnerability is, and what the community resiliency looks like within your area. And that's kind of the community resiliency is based on, you know, the, the age of your population, um, what the workforce looks like, is it uh, and you have a lot of um, you know, is there a lot of need and assistance within that area? OK, uh, so this is just for flooding. Uh, That's kind of what that impact map looks like. Uh, this is for hurricanes. So obviously you can tell uh, you know, which area of the country is susceptible to hurricanes. And then this is for tornadoes, OK? So with that being said, once you identify the threat, it's important to start going into the risk assessment process. So this template that I'm showing you here can provide organizations with a structured approach in order to anticipate and mitigate potential risk before they become a crisis. So th this risk assessment process includes the identification and evaluation of critical business functions and assets that must be protected. Uh, by conducting a thorough risk assessment, businesses become more significantly, significantly more effective in their investment strategies and more prepared to address unnecessary risks such as inadequate supplies, resources, and staffing. OK, so what I've done here is this column identifies all the threats that I'm susceptible to within my business operation. Then I define what the probability is of those uh, threats occurring. Those threats, the probability is based on this type of resource. You know, these maps right here tell us what the probability is. Then we start to look at uh, severity. So severity is going to be based on vulnerability, the magnitude of the event or the threat, and then what mitigative efforts do you have in place now? So when we look at vulnerability, we're looking at people, property, the environment. When we talk about hurricanes, not only is it going to hurt, you know, not only are we susceptible just from uh, our own organization, but the community. OK, uh, so the more people that are impacted, the more, more vulnerable you are. Same thing with property. Is, is it going to cause $10,000 in property damage or is it going to cause $150,000 in property damage? There's a huge, uh, you know, there's a huge difference between those two numbers. Uh, as far as magnitude, we're looking at duration. So if, if we had a hurricane, you know, impact our, our, our operation, how long would we be out of business for? OK, what types of what other interruptions would it cause? Are we contractually obligated to, to meet ourselves with other vendors? What is that? Uh, what type of business interruptions is it going to cause? Uh, what is the financial impact? All right, these are all variables that we consider in the magnitude. And then lastly, we look at mitigation. So what do we have currently in place to prevent uh, the effects of a hurricane? Well, we can't really prevent a hurricane from occurring, OK? But we can be prepared, OK? We can do things to our, to our within our organization to better prepare for hurricanes. What are we going to do if a hurricane does, recur, does occur how well are we going to respond? What resources do we have to respond? And then what does the recovery effort look like? OK, once you start to go through here and you can mark these uh, numerically, one being low or zero being not applicable, one being low, two meaning moderate and three being high, you can go through and get a risk index. OK. So let's kind of quickly talk about We'll, we'll go through an exercise specifically for Hines County. Um, so these are the previous disaster declarations that have been issued within Hines County within the last uh, 20 years. So we can quickly see here the incident category, which is the same thing as the threats that we identified. Um, and then what is the number that have occurred in this area? So we've had 10 hurricane declarations uh, within Hines County primarily just from the wind damages and stuff like that from the coast. Um, seven severe storms, two biological issues, 
two tornadoes, one snowstorm, and one severe ice storm. Okay. So we, if we were to go through this exercise, we would say it's a high probability that we would have uh, that we would need to prepare for, respond to, and recover from a hurricane. Okay. So with that high probability, we rank it one, two, or three. And we'll kind of I'll show you, I'll share with the the group why we use this number 3.3, 2.2, and 1.1. Uh, but it's pretty simple once you see it, once you see the math come out. Uh, so we're going to say it's a high severity scenario. So hurricanes, high severity is three. Uh, if we had a hurricane hit uh, a business within this area, a lot of people would be impacted by that. OK, and there it could potentially cause you know, multiple casualties. So we're going to mark that as a three. Uh, property would definitely be impacted by uh, by a hurricane, high winds. Uh, probably it's probably not going to negatively impact the environment as much as as far as you know, we may damage trees, but we're not going to have a bunch of environmental remediation that has to occur. Uh, duration uh, would definitely take our business out of operation for say one or two weeks if it were pretty severe. Uh, the business interruptions would be uh, pretty moderate. Uh, it would also cause, you know, pretty moderate financial impact. Uh, we cannot prevent the hurricane from occurring, so this stays the same. Preparation, uh, we can do a lot of things to prepare for a hurricane. Uh, we can do a lot of things to make sure we have the right resources in place to respond. And our recovery efforts, maybe those are more moderate. Maybe it's going to take a lot, a lot of time to get um, you know, groups involved from other areas of the country to come and help us from the recovery aspect. So with that, we do the vulnerability plus the magnitude plus the mitigation, what those scores are, that equals our severity. And then we multiply that times 3.3 and we come up with a risk score of 63%. So if we were to do that exercise for every single one of these threats, we look at tornadoes, flooding, active shooters, fires, explosions, hazmat spills, cyber attacks, power outages, and structural failure. This is just, you know, at kind of, obviously this is kind of an ad hoc exercise. Uh, you know, we can kind of start to see that if we were to rank our risks and focus the allocation of our resources towards our highest, highest risk, we would look at hazmat spills as being our biggest threat, okay? Fires and explosions would be second. Um, and this, you know, having this information readily available to us helps guide the decision making process. So if you start to analyze the data, why is our risk so high when it comes to hazmat spills? Well, it's because it obviously it affects a lot of it has the potential to. Um, you know, harm a lot of people. Uh, it would take us out of business for a couple of days. Uh, there's a lot of financial impacts associated with it. We don't have a lot. Uh, we haven't really done anything to help prevent them. Uh, we don't have from a preparation standpoint. We're not very prepared. Uh, we don't have a response team in house to respond to a hazmat spill and it would take a while to recover from it. So that's why our risk is higher. OK, uh, but if we start to take a look at maybe a structural failure, the probability is pretty low. But if it did occur, the, we'd be very vulnerable to it. The magnitude would be very high, but we've got more mitigative efforts in place to prevent the structural collapse. So that's why it's a lower risk. OK. So kind of moving forward, some special considerations uh, that you should consider when you're doing your risk assessment is not to forget the secondary and tertiary uh, tertiary effects uh, associated with it. So just remember that if you have a tornado, that would be the primary event. Uh, if that tornado hits your facility, it may cause a fire. You know, it may cause a hazmat spill. Those are all kind of considered secondary and tertiary effects. Uh, it's also important to consider the population density in the impacted area. Uh, if, if you're working in a remote location, maybe there's three or four employees only. Uh, the effect is not going to be nearly as bad as it would if you're in a, um, a, a manufacturing facility with 1200 to 2000 employees. OK, uh, once again, kind of going back to the competencies of the people that are performing the risk, the, the risk assessment. 
is do they truly have a scientific understanding of the hazard and the threat? Uh, it's also important to consider employee education and the knowledge of the emergency actions that are taken. So we can design all these programs and put all these response uh, actions in place, but if we don't educate our people to truly understand what actions to take, then our program is not, not going to be effective. So for instance, I asked um, a client one time, based on their risk, what types of exercises and drills do they do? And they told us that, yeah, we, exercise, we do a, a facility-wide evacuation every year. Well, that's great, but their biggest risk was a tornado. So their tornado would require you to shelter in place. So we need to focus our knowledge and our training and our drills on the risks that we face and what actions our employees need to take the most. Okay. It's also important to understand the existence of early warning systems and lines of communication. I can't stress enough the importance of having early warning systems. Okay, whether that's uh, you know lightning detection, um, you know tornado monitoring, whatever that process is uh, of how you're going to monitor those threats continuously, and then also the lines of communication that becomes very unclear leading up to an emergency and then after the emergency occurs. So typically during the emergency, it's pretty defined within your program how you're going to communicate. But leading up to it, uh, I've been in situations where you're getting a thousand calls about, you know, uh, we're in a tornado watch. What are we doing today? Uh, what's the plan? You know, are we working outside? Are we bringing up all the oper are we shutting all the operations down? What are we doing? OK, so those you know lines of communication become very unclear leading up to the emergency and then after the emergency does occur you know there's you're getting phone calls from you know various organizations uh, you know various departments so that's it's very important to make sure you consider that uh, in your planning phase uh, also look at the availability and readiness of your emergency response personnel uh, not every day are you equally as prepared uh, there may be days on site where i've got you know five or six uh, trained emergency response uh, emergency responders that are that are available. Uh, but then, you know, depending on personnel, shift changes and stuff like that, you know, I, I may be susceptible to a, a threat uh, more today than I would be tomorrow simply because of the, the availability of my emergency response personnel. So it's important to consider that. Uh, and then also look at the cultural factors that influence, you know, public response and warnings. Uh, so I always try to communicate to to our clients that is imperative that you develop a relationship with your local officials. OK, uh, talk to your emergency management directors, talk to your your police chief, your fire chief, make sure that they understand what your what you feel like your biggest risks are and are they capable of responding to that, uh, those types of situations effectively. OK. Uh, as far as pillars for success, uh, hey, I kind of hey, made Jaren, a few, Sorry yes. to interrupt, but uh, we launched a poll question uh, that the okay. audience can participate in. Um, and so if you click the link in the, the chat box or go to menti.com on your mobile device and enter the code, uh, you can answer this question. It's a yes or no question. Have you ever performed a focused risk assessment for these types of threats and their business impacts? Looks like we've got some good participation so far. Um, most of you say you have not performed a focused risk assessment, but uh, looks like somebody has. Salt's trickling in. So it's, it's looking like 50 50 roundabout, yeah. a little more no than uh, than yes. Let's see if we can wait just a few few more minutes. I'd like to see if we can get some some more numbers in for sure. Okay. 
and it's neck and neck. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. Good. I mean, that just shows us, you know, there's there's definitely opportunity to improve for sure. I mean, if if 50 percent of us are, are doing them, then that's great. You know, that that leaves the other remaining 50 percent, you know, opportunities to. To continue to kind of improve upon the strategic, you know, plan and strategy that you use to to identify these threats and the severity of them. Go ahead and move on then. I think now we're just, just going to kind of quickly talk about a few pillars for success. Um, you know, once you have you to reshare your screen, Jaron. Sorry about that. Okay. So once you perform that focus risk assessment, what do you do with it? How do you use that data to make informed decisions? Uh, so the, the main thing is the, uh, to make sure to analyze the data, look for trends, um, you know, find ways to reduce the risk by, you know, through preventative and mitigative matters. All right. So just keep in mind that prevention reduces probability. OK, so we know if we can prevent the event from occurring, the probability is going to go down, obviously. But when we start to look at preparation, response, recovery, just know that those can only really, those are really only designed to reduce the severity uh, and mitigate the impact or lessen the impact of the event, knowing that it still will occur, okay? Uh, going back to some of the statements I made earlier about uh, the importance of establishing metrics uh, and communicating those metrics to your senior leadership team uh, is, you know, establishing thresholds. So, you know, maybe we've got this, uh, you know, we've got this threat of fire, you know, at our, at our plant. We've got fire protection systems. We've got an industrial fire brigade team. Uh, we, we do really good training, uh, but now all of a sudden we're going to bring in a new process that's going to generate a completely different type of fire hazard and fire risk, and we're not trained uh, to be able to respond to that risk accordingly, okay? So if we continue to update our program, we would quickly establish that this new risk, this new or emerging risk, it seeds our acceptable threshold. So we've got to do something about that. So now we need to sit down with management and say, hey, you guys decided to bring in this new process. That's great. But look what it's done to our, our risk registry. And what do we need to do to get this risk back under an acceptable threshold? Okay, that's why those metrics are important. Anytime you exceed the threshold, you maintain the metric. And anytime you exceed the threshold, you need to have that sit down conversation and formal, you know, risk based discussion with the leadership team. Uh, also, make sure that you allocate resources uh, to reduce the highest risk first. So once again, the topic of the month approach is what we want to avoid. We don't want to see necessarily even distribution of your resources across every single threat that's identified. Let's focus on reducing reducing our highest risk first. So, you know, I know that there's a lot of the times we, you know, we all have a budget that we're trying to keep in mind. We're all trying to get the newest tools uh, to make us perform better. But at the end of the day, let's focus on our our highest risk, our physical risk and mitigating those first. And then anything that's left over, then we can use uh, and allocate towards some of the lower risk, low hanging fruit type opportunities. And then once again, you just use the metrics, use the data to make informed strategic decisions. OK, so anytime you're having a conversation with your leadership team and you're having uh, to justify things, use the data. OK, use that risk registry to prove to them statistically why you're wanting to do this and what it's going to do to the company and how it's going to benefit the company and your operation. It's going to make you more resilient if we focus on this approach to reduce our risk to below this threshold. OK. And then lastly uh, is having a maturity model in place. So exercise and test your response capabilities 
at whatever frequency that you feel like is needed for your operation. OK, it's not uh, it's not black and white. OK, not every single uh, organization needs to practice their plan the, the exact same. OK, there's various components that need to be tested more frequently. Uh, there's different tabletop discussions that should be held at a senior management level. Uh, there's different activities that you want your essential and non-essential personnel to do. So test those based on your risk. Test those based on the frequency that makes sense for your organization. OK. But it's not um, it's not going to help you if you've got this written plan that only a few people know about and it's managed in silos. It's not integrated into your business operation and. It, it's basically just there to collect dust sometimes, and that's what we see a lot of a lot of times is. You know, we, we've got these programs in place, but they haven't been updated in five or six years. OK, so you have to establish some type of review frequency um, to ensure that your emergency contacts are up to date, uh, that the risks are uh, appropriate. Uh, the, the risk assessment and business impact analysis is up to date. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into maintaining the program. Um, I also find it very important to try to incorporate this program into your management of change process. OK, so as your business changes operations, uh, maybe you take equipment out, maybe you're bringing equipment in, maybe you're change, maybe you have some organizational changes um, in the org chart. So you used to have, you know, 10 supervisors in this area. And now you only have three. OK, that's going to drastically change drastically impact the effect the effectiveness of these programs okay and then make sure to just to continuously review the status with all your stakeholders okay not just the senior management team make sure you communicate the status uh, to other stakeholders as well you know communicate it with the community uh, you know business leaders community leaders um, you know shop floor employees they all need to know what the status of your emergency uh, management and business continuity program is. OK. So lastly, it's just kind of a quick call to action. Um, you know, being a consultant in this uh, kind of focusing on this specific topic, we're here to help. You know, call us if you have any questions. Uh, I I've told several people that I will offer a free consultation just to sit down and talk to you about your experience, your background, what your concerns are and ways that we feel like we can help. OK, um, this is what I'm passionate about. I really do enjoy working with them, uh, working with companies uh, to better you know, mitigate their their operational risk. I find that you know, emergency management business continuity um, is a big win for most companies because it's typically not one of their strengths. Uh, but if you can demonstrate that you, you're making the uh, the business more resilient, then they tend to be more open to the ideas and the concepts that we're trying to share. OK, and that lastly, I hope that moving forward, uh, most of us can see that there is a benefit to using a, a risk based approach uh, to, to developing and maintaining this program versus the compliance, strictly a compliance approach, which is more of a check the box type activity. OK. So great job, Jaron. I wanted to uh, thank everybody again for joining us today. Uh, mine and Jaron's contact information. And uh, thanks again for joining us. This concludes our presentation. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great day.